Well, we welcome everybody to spring Bible class for the ladies. We're grateful that you're present here in the classroom at the building as well as on Zoom, on the internet. And we hope this will be a profitable study as we start off with the book of Ecclesiastes. What I'm going to do in this particular study is deal with the introductory matters concerning Ecclesiastes. And we will look some things concerning uh, some background information. But the first thing I'm going to do is have you look at Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 14. Now, we'll then, uh, for anybody, we'll start to turn there, as far as the class here at the building, to chapter 12, 13, too. Also, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, also. I will go ahead and uh, read the first one of these, and hopefully it's picking up well. Verse 14 of Ecclesiastes 1. I have seen the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Well, keep that in mind. That's the beginning of the book, 14 verses into it. Now I want to go over to the last chapter of the book, chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now the truth of the matter is, whatever details were brought out in the book, as to what the provider intends to convey to his readers. The main points are in those two verses. Now I want you to hold that before I say anything else about them, except emphasize that the message of the book is found in those two verses. That doesn't mean, and let me repeat myself, that all of the details that he deals with are found in those two verses, but those are the points he wants to make, and he does do throughout the, so throughout the book. Now, there are different views on who wrote the book. I'll deal with that just for a little bit. If you read in the first verse, the Bible says the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, King James Version. Now that's uh, pretty plain to the point. We don't have to wonder who the son of David was who was king in Jerusalem. But one of them. Now, there are those who don't think that Solomon wrote this as far as the human hand inspired to sit down. But if I say, no, Solomon did not write it, I'm forced to say, if I'm looking with a human hand, <laughs> well, then who did? The Holy Spirit had this writer say the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. What is there about the book that says, I should think of somebody else other than Solomon. But I promise you, if you look in various commentaries, mm -hmm. you'll see that they will say it, it couldn't be Solomon for one big reason because he turned out to be such a wicked rascal. I would simply say this. Jesus, in speaking to the people of his day, and we all know how hypocritical and the Pharisees, that sect of the Jews, were in Jesus' day. The same was true of the high priest and many of the lawyers, certainly the Sadducees and Herodians. But Jesus said, when they sit in Moses' seat, do 
what they they do. But then he told them, but don't follow their example, for they say and do not. Now, what does that tell me? That tells me that people can know the truth and teach the truth and not live it themselves. Now, that's one answer to the fact that Solomon, from all the record we have in the inspired volume, uh, doesn't leave him in a good light at all. But I'm still forced to say, well, he was still the wisest man. And a lot of wise men, when it comes to their teaching, teach, but they may not live up to it themselves. That's one answer to those who say, well, as bad as he was, certainly he didn't write it. Well, when I get through with that, the, the scripture explicitly, just so many words, says the words of the preacher, the son of David, King Jerusalem, what am I going to do with that? I've got to find out a way, if it is not King Solomon that wrote it, I've got to figure out a logical, scriptural way that he could say that did not mean what he said. Is there, some people will say, well, it's it's somebody who, like the writer of Hebrews, who we may have a strong opinion it was Paul, uh, that it's somebody who says, because everybody knows the wisdom of Solomon, everybody knows the wealth of Solomon, the glory of Solomon, uh, the kingdom riches, the zenith of power unto Solomon, uh, and everything he did. I mean, he, it was as far as a human ruler that you couldn't surpass him in that day and time. So they just adopted the idea of Solomon because of what is said specifically in the book. Because Solomon, the Jew knew, as well as we still do today, Solomon would have been able to experience everything he said this guy experienced. But there's another possibility. And it is that when the historical part of the divine record about Solomon ends, we don't have everything in that historical record said about Solomon. There is the possibility that he repented. And in his very old age, says, here's where I messed up. Now, we don't find it strange that David could do what he did. And we know the scripture is explicit on that. There's so many words, he repented. Well, what's there to say that Solomon didn't repent in his old age? He still would be the wisest man there. He still would know if he repented, he would know the truth that he had left and lived in error for a long time and saw what it did. So I'm still forced to take verse 1 literally. And it says the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Because I can't replace it with anything else. And I have to strain somewhat to come up with these other explanations. This is this is the kind of thing uh, Ken has talked about on, on Wednesday night in a precisely stated proposition. That precisely stated proposition always makes a claim. It's a sentence, but all sentences don't make a claim. Uh, a proposition to be debated is precise on your term. And it's precisely therefore stated. And in stating it, you make a claim. Such as the apostle Paul in the process of becoming a Christian repenting of sin. Makes a claim that the baptism of the Great Commission, Mark 16, 16, is the baptism. That those on the day of Pentecost obey. And the claim that. So we're not just making a sentence, but we're putting out there something that says demand proof that what we affirm is the case. Well, the Holy Spirit says the words of the preacher, the son of David, King in Jerusalem. 
Now, what if what can I do to say, oh, he didn't mean that? <laughs> but it means something else. Now, I'm not going to fall out with people who say that uh, they just let Solomon represent uh, uh, people who had it all. The message is still there. The message that the writer gets over is there. I'm just going to take verse one at face value. Most of our our brethren, sound brethren, not all, will take that position. You pick up most of the commentaries that are written by by our brethren. I've known of some that didn't. Al, Al Brown didn't. But yeah. he taught a very good class on Ecclesiastes. He didn't He would it. teach you the same thing. Yes. Uh, it's like getting into an argument over who wrote the Hebrews. That's the reason you hear me say every once in a while, who wrote the Bible? God did. Right. Because all scriptures give them inspiration of God. I don't care what human hand wrote it down. So, you know, if, we, if, if because of the way Solomon uh, lived, we don't believe he wrote it, then that's fine. But I'm going to just take it for what it says here. And this is the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. But the very next thing is really, if you don't approach the book from the right perspective, it doesn't make sense. He says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, I'm going to get down in a minute to the name of the book and so on, but I wanted to mention that. Because we've all in school, high school, or whatever, had to write term papers or some sort of, you just call them themes, do that call them. But you had to have a theme, didn't you? You're supposed to, anyway, come up with a theme. Well, uh, verse two, pretty much the theme of this book. And you say, well, how can a godly person have that view? I hear the key. He's not writing it from the standpoint of the godly person. I would not say today from the standpoint of a faithful member of the church and what I know about the Bible and the Christian system, the New Testament, would you say a vanity of vanity, all the vanity, vanity being pointless or worthless? Is all worthless? Is your life worthless? Is it pointless? And if I would ask you, because I know in here you don't think it is, but then why do you not think it is? And then on what grounds do you, you determine that? Because of what the Bible teaches about spiritual things, about how to live this life, what this life is for, how we're to use it. We go back to the Beatitudes. And he's talking about the attitude, the mindset that we ought to have as we approach God while we're still in the flesh on the earth. And that's a very important point. If you take this as a godly man saying vanity is vanity, all is vanity, you're in all sorts of problems. And that goes against a lot of scriptures to say that uh, life is pointless and everything in life is pointless. But that's not, we'll get more into that later, but that's not the way it would be. And it's hard for us, I realize, to think that way. But it's not the way it would be if you do not believe in God. And if you're trying to make everything line up where there is no God, there is no uh, afterlife, there is no judgment, there is no heaven, there is no hell, but you're fleshly, and when you're dead, you're just going to have existence. Then what is the point of life? You come to the same conclusion, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So it's important that we realize this is the way that he deals with it. Now, we'll, we'll see things as we go through this. Now, let me uh, let me mention some other things introductory to this. This was uh, written, if it is the case, that Solomon wrote it. Uh, around a thousand years before Christ, 940, if you get, try to get specific. Um, again, the age of Solomon works in very well here, his chronological age. It, it, it's like a here is a man who is a very tired and worn out. And he's looking back 
over his whole life. You say, what's the meaning of it? What's the purpose of it? Well, I can tell you as a Christian, answering from the word of God, but if you don't have that, how do you answer? There is, a, there is an answer, but pointing, pointing, always pointing. Man, I think anybody would see that. I understand, I think, why people who have no really belief in God or an afterlife or whatever get to maybe my age or older or even younger. And they get into bad health and they know there's no hope for them. Why? They think they're just putting themselves out of misery. And because of that. So that ought to be kept in mind. Uh, he, I think you can see in the book that he, he makes a. Um, he looks, he sounds like a man. That's made many mistakes. And maybe he made those mistakes knowing better. Another reason I think Paul wrote it, but, but nevertheless, uh, he made many mistakes. And now he's thinking about the young people to follow. What can I do to cause them not to follow in my path? I think that's important for keep in mind because it's still important. It's still important. Look at uh, chapter chapter eleven. Yeah, chapter eleven, verse nine. Notice what he says there. Chapter 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of all thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee to judgment. Therefore, you know, that view of the, of the evidence, here's our conclusion, remove sorrow from thy heart, put away evil from thy flesh, or childhood and youth of vanity. Now that childhood and youth of vanity in the same way that any part of life is vanity is God's money. Because look what we're going to run into and remember there are no chapters and verses in this. Look at what verses 9 and 10 introduce. Remove, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, when the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, have no pleasure in this. He's, you know, I've jumped all the way to the end of the book. So if you're hearing this book read, if you're studying it, then you read all this other stuff, and you've got to this point. And he's saying, don't make the mistake. Right? And because, first of all, if, if, if you could find happiness in things, in the affairs of this present world, I'll tell you. Now, the name of the book itself, Ecclesiastes, derives actually from um, the preacher. You look at verses one and two, you see it. Of chapter one. You see the same thing in verse 12. I, the preacher was king over Israel and Jerusalem. Again, that repeats what he says up here in verse, verses one and two. But then when you're going over in the book, for chapter seven, in verse 27. Behold, this have I found, said the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. The Hebrew word is koeleth. Now, if you read the commentaries or if you study about what that Hebrew word meant, 
you can get several different views, but it always had to do with somebody in official capacity as a speaker. And uh, it's been pretty well considered when you go through all of that, that thus he's a preacher. He has a message to herald out to everybody that's terribly important for them to learn. Now we get the Ecclesiastes, and that's why it's called the preacher. We get uh, that from uh, the Septuagint, because the Septuagint, remember, is the translation into Greek of the Old Testament, and we get the name of Ecclesiastes from there, and not directly from the Hebrew. Um, they would spell it uh, and transliterate it in Greek in the same way, except for we got C's in the word, they would have K's. <laughs> um, by the way, that, uh, if you know, ecclesia renders into church. Compound word. Ek is a preposition in alcohol. Uh, Kaleo is a Greek word meaning to call. So the church is called out. Each person is a member of it, called out by the gospel, they're believing, obeying it. Thus, they're called out from the world, from the life of sin. Well, this seems to me a pretty good uh, way of saying what he's up to in this book. He's trying to get people not to make these mistakes that most everybody, if not to one extent or the other, everybody makes. To one, let's say to one extent or the other. Well, you know, when you're talking about logic, you say, well, to, if, we, if we go to its logical, its ultimate conclusion, then you're trying to say, well, if you believe this premise, then let's consistently apply it in every place it applies. Of course, some people don't want to do that. They want to apply something just to where they want to apply. But truth is not like that. And certainly he's writing inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's writing truth. It's something that needs to be preached. And preachers preach what people need to hear if they're preaching the truth. So you get in you get into that when it comes to the matter of uh, of an evangelist. The Greek word euangelistes. It means as a herald from it. Now, you know, on May 6th, there's uh, King Charles III going to have his coronation. Now, if you want to get an understanding of what herald trumpets can sound like in our modern age, then uh, listen for those herald trumpets when they blow. Because in the ancient days, and Solomon would have experienced this. He would experience it being son of David. He experienced it himself. When the king came into a place, he didn't just come in and expect it. There was always somebody who went before him. Usually a great entourage. Think about when our president goes somewhere. Uh, he changes everything. If uh, any president were to come here and they were, say, coming from Huntsville to Houston, there would be a period of time in which all of I 45 would not be passable by the ordinary people. They'd shut out everything, they'd have to reroute everything. Well, uh, imagine an absolute monarch whose word is law. And the king's <clears throat> coming. Well, he has somebody to go ahead of him. Get everything, everything ready. Now, that's why you've got it like this with John the Baptist and Jesus. He's the forerunner of the Christ. Well, that was, you know, that was common to those people. Much more common than, than it is for us today, that kind of thing. So there would be then, when the king actually came, there would be the herald uh, blowing those trumpets and sounding out and all that. And the people would know all, right, all this preparation we were going through and the whole life turned upside down. He's coming. And we use the word today, highway. Well, that comes from the idea that the king's highway, their song or something has that in it. The idea was that's his. 
Sometimes they didn't let the commoner or somebody even own it. The king's highway. He could travel that anytime he wanted to. So we're removed from what gave us a lot of the words we use regularly, you know, attached to them, what they did. So you have then a, a herald blowing the coming of the king. And then you have the people who are called out as citizens to laud the king. Think of Jesus when he had his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Remember how the people uh, treated him on that day. It was a tremendous thing. Hosanna in the high, blessed be the come from the name of the Lord, and all this stuff. And uh, so we understand something about the name of the book, where it comes down to us, uh, not directly from the Hebrew, but from the Greek Septuagint. And why it's got the preacher on there is because of the Hebrew. It literally means, in most cases, the preacher. Any comments or questions? I want to emphasize again, and today the church being what the New Testament says we as individual members of the church ought to be. This is very important. And I'm just going to repeat myself. Life apart from God is meaningless. And yet people all around us don't know that. Now you're going to see him get into detail. All pursuits, whatever kind they are, every effort you put forth that pertains to time, space, and flesh, all those efforts are futile when God excluded from them. And since the works of God cannot be thwarted, then what do we conclude? Well, that only the life of faithful service to God can put a bad in a burden life and give purpose to your life. I remember all my life in Bible classes, especially um, when you're starting out, or at least they're teaching a class of, uh, of say, new members, or maybe the uh, preachers in gospel meeting and the preaching of Sunday you know, and have a sermon, or at least be mentioned in a sermon, you know, what, where do we come from? What are we here for? And where are we going? Well, I think for me, you don't believe at all, and you're in a culture that denies it, and nobody in your family believes it either, that God exists. Tell me how you find meaning in your life. You don't. This has been one of the amazing things about communism, especially the kind we've known. Now, communism means it can be a number of things, but the Marxist Leninist type of communism that held Russia and still holds China, North Vietnam, and North Korea, not North Vietnam anymore, Vietnam period. Uh, you'd have to understand something about it, but they deny the existence of God. And everything is formed around that. But the communist was, would ridicule somebody who believed in God and heaven because all you do is work for the pie in the sky by and by. <laughs> What they're doing is saying, if there's anything going to be accomplished, it's done while you're alive on this earth. And when you're dead, you're gone. But what you accomplish while you're alive is for the next generation. But you know, he even treats that in the book of Ecclesiastes. And we'll get there in a minute, but he basically stuff that in a minute, if we will. <laughs> he basically, he basically says, um, get out there and do all this work. You learn all that you can learn. In fact, on everything you have of everybody else in this world. And then what? He even worries over who's going to get his hard earned money <laughs> and will they appreciate it. I started to bring a quote, and I've had it for years and years. I can almost quote it. I can't probably that. I was preaching in a meeting years ago in North Central Texas. And I was staying at a member's house, and they had uh, 
some books there on the side table of the bed. <clears throat> I saw one that interested me. It was about one of the old Texas ranchers at the time. Uh, he he was uh, doing all of his building up of his big ranch. Uh, all, well, really half of the 19th century. And when he came to the end of his days, or he realized they were coming, not that he was actually in a terminal illness, but he knew that uh, he couldn't last longer. And he makes a statement, I'm worth one million dollars, and none of them will buy me another day of life. Now, a million dollars today is a lot of money, but a million dollars in 1900? I don't know how much that would be as far as buying power. He basically summed up what Solomon says to him. All the things he did to get to where he is, not going to do a bit of good, but he's not going to be in the fire, and it can't hold him to his life. Can't do it at all. So life apart from God means. Now this is an old textbook. You're Abilene, you might have had this book. It's Hester's book on the heart of Hebrew history. It was used by the colleges uh, a lot uh, for, for various ones of them. And it's not a member of the church, but he has some pretty good comments. On page 311, he says, the purpose of the book seems to be to show that self-gratification and successful worldliness do not bring satisfaction to the human heart. Life without a knowledge of, a knowledge of and fellowship with God is empty and meaningless. Man has a destiny which calls for cooperation with God in some worthy enterprise. And in this he finds abiding peace of soul. Now think about that. And I know y'all, I'm assuming you have read the book. And I might suggest to you that you read it every week. <laughs> Get through it. <laughs> At least every week. You can go through it in a hurry. And I read it this afternoon. A few days ago I read it. And if they had all the stuff with Jody going on, I might have read it in <laughs> but, but I didn't think about it. But uh, I can't emphasize enough of, of just reading a book before you get into word studies and all that because it familiarizes you with with the text. And uh, anyway, I don't know of a more up-to-date book than the book of I think what I've said thus far, and even what we read, is quite clear on that. Let me give you uh, some things here and see if you can answer them by the verses that I'll give you. Because really, there are about three big questions. And they're designed to probe the mind of the person. Here. And make him meditate on it throughout the whole of the book. And the first question is, what profit does a man have under the sun? Well, we've been talking about that. Now, look at chapter 1, verse 3, and then chapter 3, verse 9. That's where we get those, that idea. What profit has a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? And then three, verse nine, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laid it? But he's, he's, he's asking you that. When you're in a class and you have a teacher asking a rhetorical question, why do we say a rhetorical question? Was it designed by who? Make you think. And that's what Solomon's doing. What you're seeing is a typical way that people were taught to go there. Many times in the classes, a question would be asked, the students would repeat it back, the answer. And that's what you've got going on. And so repetition was used. And to this day, learning from the repetition. Repetition, repetition. It just happened. It's just that way. 
you said uh, the second epistle beloved I now write to you which will I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance you've heard this sermon before but here it comes again <laughs> and they probably heard it many more times than that but look at look at the answer if God's not in the picture chapter 2 verse 11 chapter 2 verse 11 then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do and behold all was vanity and vexation spirit and there was no problem in this so now we just introduced something else there we've already seen one of the common words is vanity we defined it pointless worthless but now we notice another one and this is an important one in that very chapter 2 verse 11 look at the last three words of the verse Understood. now when you're out of this life you're not under this sun or any other sun as far as you is concerned so that kind of sets the context of where he's talking about on the earth, on the, earth. the very important we'll see where that comes into play a little later that actually uh, is a passage that's used by Jehovah's Witnesses try to say that when man dies, he just goes unconscious. But we'll we'll wait we get there. Then in chapter five, verse sixteen, chapter five, verse sixteen, and this also is a story that in all points as he came, so shall he go. What profit that he that hath labored for the wind? You know, we still use some of that term at all. You labor for the wind. What thought crosses your mind? You labor for the wind. You're nothing. resting. Nothing. Nothing. It's all <laughs> You can chase it all you want, but you can't. So much for that. Yeah. <laughs> two days on it, but it's gone now or something like that. So he's using terms. You know, he's teaching some tremendous points of wisdom that he uses for the common person to understand. So that's his first question. What profit does a man have under the sun? And uh, none. He labors for the wind. But the, the profit all over again. <laughs> the profit, he's talking from a, the spiritual profit. You know, it's, it's not the temporal, right? Well, He's trying to say now, if, if you did, you think of the people that would have received this book originally, they wouldn't be people who didn't know God. They wouldn't be people who said, well, I don't believe anything in the scriptures. They would have been people like that. But what was Israel's big problem? They didn't live up to what they had. They, they uh, if you read the prophets, when they're really getting after be nice about it <laughs> but either israel uh, the united oh, kingdom right. or northern kingdom after the division southern kingdom what are they told all the time they were trying to be like everybody else they, they started that way we want a king why I know people have. That's, and that's always been the case and the shortcomings of people in approaching god yeah. That's one reason God says, I'm not like a man. If we could just understand what we ought to and could in this life of God, it would make a great big difference. And how we do everything in life. So the prophets got after Israel because they forgot the widow, they forgot the orphan, they gave the halt and the lame uh, sacrifices to God. Well, what they do with the blue ribbon line? They can't get it. <laughs> That's what they did. And so he's saying, This is the reason that you are in misery. It's made different than you, and it's because I didn't believe in God. And he's saying to the young people, basically, don't fall on their steps. I don't know any other way to say it. Uh, but that's the thrust of the book. Now, the next question that the second one that he emphasizes 
what is it good for man to do in life? You see how it was over there, over there, over left. What is it good for man to do in life? And you see that's uh, introduced in verse three. Notice he says, I sought in my heart to give myself the wine that acquainting my heart with wisdom and the lay hold of the Father till I might see what was that good for the sons of men which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. Again, <clears throat> you can see him look out at the class almost and say, answer that question. Or in a test, this is a discussion question. You answer it personally. And you've got you can spend three pages of writing on it if you want to. How many pages you want to let them do? Tell them that's that what they've got to do is a discussion question on a test. Because that's how personal this was meant to be to the person who read the book. I suggest all the Bible that way. That when you read it, I don't care if it's the rest of the church at Ephesus or the many congregations of Galatia. Or whatever, for it to be something that works well with me, I have to read it like he wrote it to me. So that's the second question. Now, look at chapter 2 and verse 10. That's the question. Look at the answer now. What is it good for men to do in life? Okay, now look at chapter 2, verse 10. We'll start there. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Hold that right there. He's not saying as a faithful child of God. He's saying that in the standpoint of the person without God trying to find all the answers in life. He's saying, will you learn from my mistakes? If you want to look at it that way. Because they all recognize Solomon to be wise because he asked God to give him wisdom. And remember, God says, since you saw fit to ask for wisdom and not for glory and honor and power and might. I will give you that wisdom and I'll give you the rest of it too. And remember who was it that said when she had the fame of Solomon had spread abroad and she made a special trip to Jerusalem to see him. And after she was there with him, what did she say? Never the half has never <laughs> yet been told. And we even put that in a song to refer to heaven sometimes. So that's what he had accomplished among the people of his day. And this is another, this is another person who had plenty of money herself and power. She's an absolute monarch too. And she says, well, what I heard didn't do it justice. That's what she said. Now look at uh, verse 24. In the same chapter, verse 24. There's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hands of God. Does God anywhere in the Bible, whatever kind of history was, right down to the New Testament that governs us today, does he want us to enjoy what we have? Yeah. Well, then how does this figure in that he that we would say uh, this is that way? Uh, that this is something that's, that's not the best thing. Well, let's read, let's hold all that in your mind. Let's read uh, chapter 3 and verse 22. Chapter 3, verse 22. Wherefore, I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own work that is his portion. But who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Now, you realize what he's saying? 
if anybody's going to enjoy what I've accomplished, whatever it is, it's going to be me. <laughs> He's describing actually a form of being self willed and self -esteem. I will enjoy what I did. He sounds like somebody the Lord told about. Yeah. The rich farmer. born down Bill That's Hebron. right. And what did God say to him? That your soul will be required of me. My soul shall be required of me. Now, take that comment and think about what we've been saying tonight. And what Solomon would say. Okay. Looking at life from the standpoint of no God or not service to God. And you get the rich younger, or the roots of a uh, farmer. You get him. Well, doesn't that sound like Solomon? Now, look also at chapter 5, I believe it is. Chapter 5. In verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 5, 18. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him for his portion. You see, he acknowledges that God gave it to him, but who's getting the benefit of it? What did he say? Whatever God gives to you, who should really get the benefit of it? You should. He doesn't bring anybody else in there. He doesn't speak of being benevolent and with an overabundance, you're able to do so much more to help other people. He's no different from the fellow that said, I'll tell him my part to do a bigger one. Yeah, he's saying to be thankful for what God has done and given us, right? Not here. Uh, uh, no, he's saying, he's saying, even if he's saying, if you because remember, he's right to people believe in God, right? They believe in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, think of the Solomon's temple, think of the worship under the law, all those things. What I think he is saying is that whatever you have, then if it comes from God. Who really should enjoy it? It's a selfishness. It's a selfishness. Yeah. It's mine. We used to talk about a prayer that the selfish father prayed, trying to teach uh, how we should be. I like God. the guy that stood up and said, uh, forgive me if I have any sin. Well, you're talking about when Jesus was talking about yeah. The Pharisee and the publican looked up to him and said, Have you got me? And the publican smoked his breast, we'll look up to heaven to be most of the time. But you got to realize, you, you, you got to realize the whole context of the whole book says, What do I do with what I have here? I don't care where it came from. What do I do with what I have here? What I was going to say is, uh, if I can remember the thing, it was a little poem, but it was offering a prayer. Bless me, my son John. There we go. Bless me, my son John, my wife, us four, no more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that covers a whole lot of white people think. Yeah. How much did Jesus say about giving? Now, first of all, you lie. But then, what you have been prospering. What do you say? What do you say? I mean, not just him, what does the whole New Testament teach? Well, I've said many times in sermons take giving out of Christianity and destroy it. Now, it does allow you to continue to grow in understanding the importance of giving and being mindful of those who have less than you so you can give to them. I'll tell this. Jody and I were talking about uh, last week uh, about a couple we knew. They were the oldest her parents were. And they were members of the church. And uh, they had lots and lots of money. <laughs> lots and lots of money. They had lots and lots more. <laughs> yeah, they still had more. <laughs> but she told Jody one time. She said, you know, it is a 
hard thing to know how to use this money. Sometimes we don't understand uh, just what we have before. Now you say, well, yeah, I don't have that kind of money. Oh, everybody in here has money compared to the rest of the world, at least uh, most of them. Now, um, when it comes to what we have, how, how, what, <coughs> what is it to be rich? Yeah. <laughs> I'm <solid> rich. <laughs> so it one thing about giving that you, the Bible makes it clear you can, as a baby in Christ, or anything else that stays in the Christian life, you can grow. <laughs> you can grow to know what to do with things. You can see things as you continue to pray and to study, to get active in the church and trying to prepare yourself to teach others, working with people, seeing the situations they're in, and, and having them. Um, uh, the of human kindness that uh, all this kind of thing. You don't see that in this person, Ecclesiastes. Let me ask you this. Where have you ever seen a hospital built by atheists? Where have you ever seen a nursing home built by atheists? Do you know me? You know? They don't exist. That's always, I thought, very strange for all these atheists trying to say, oh, yes, we can have an objective standard of right and wrong and deny the existence of God. Well, all right. Why is it then among those who at least have an understanding that Christianity is giving and benevolent and loving, why is it they're the only ones that build this, that, or the other orphan home? It's all. Have you ever heard of an atheist orphan home? I'll tell you what you have heard of. Big support for what? It's been very controversial even the now and will be. Not they're not the only one. What's the opposite of right to lie? <laughs> the abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. They're going to be behind that. Yeah. They're going to be behind uh, pro-choice. Yeah, well, pro-death. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what they call it. But uh, nevertheless, without with the disposition of mind he is setting forth here, why wouldn't you feel that? Way? Exactly. Why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You got too many mouths to feed. You better watch. Brother Woods years ago, before this ever became. Law, of course, has changed now, at least in Supreme Court perspective. It would have been somewhere in about 19. This thing passed in 73 originally, did the Supreme Court came down to Truman Road, which is late. But this would have been when I can remember very well the young preacher battling this right and left. This would have been about 1971 or 72. Brother Wood was handling the open form of the old free army, and he said, um, he told the story. He said, a woman came in to the doctor and uh, she had a little child about three years old with her and she was expecting. And she says, I want an abortion. Well, he says, why? We just can't afford another child. We would barely get by now. We would barely do anything to say this one. I just don't want to have another child. He said, okay. Sitting around here, and he acts like he reached in, he got his scalpel, and he said, It's like he's going to cut her throat. And the mother, I had a fit. And he said, Why are you upset? We get to her a lot easier, we can't get it down. And some things need to be dealt with just that way. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if God's not in the whole thing, and I'm a creature of God to give an account for, to, my, for, to Him for my life. Based on this book, and at the time he spoke, it would have been well, most of the Jews. You know, what good is it? Then? So you have, did I ever read 518? I think I did. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a second question. First, from what profit does a man have under the sun? Second, one, what is it good for man to do in life? Well, without God, what was it Paul said? Let us eat, drink, and be Now he quoted that 
because that was the attitude of the Romans. When they had reached a stage, even these Romans would be considered billionaires today. When they reached a stage where their health started going down, they were sick, whatever. It was routine for them to commit suicide. They basically did it by getting in a hot bath of water and, and cutting their wrist and sit there and bleed them. Why? Because the days of eating, drinking, enjoying the fruit of one's labor and whatever else is gone. That's what this guy in North Texas, the old rancher, was actually saying. So the last question is, what is my purpose for existing? You realize that these three questions are good to ask anybody you trust as a Bible study with that they would take you seriously. What is my purpose for existing? How does he end up the book? In answer to that question. Yeah. Verses 13 and 14. The last two verses in the whole book. So notice it has let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Well, what is the whole matter? Everything has been silent up to that. If God's not in it, then the vanity on everything we do under the sun. So fear God and keep his commandments and so do you then. And then he reminds him it doesn't end at death. You talk to people nowadays and you get the idea of everything's going to just cease at death. But he ends it with verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now look how that parallels to Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27. What did the writer there say? It's pointed unto men who wants to die. Yeah, that's that's Isn't that parallel with this? Yeah. Now, what does that tell us about what was taught among those Jews under the law of Moses? They knew these things. They knew they had to give account to God. Now, did they remember it? Might as well as Americans remember it. Might as well as been members of the church when you now, here's the thing about the book. Am I going to run over time? I got a few seconds. What time do y'all have? I got five to eight. I'm probably slow. I don't know. Uh, 7.59. Real quick, <laughs> there's a style in the introduction of the book. It's a style of Ecclesiastes. Some people think it's a very pessimistic book. That's just not the case. Uh, it's not the style of somebody who's a complainer or one who has withdrawn himself from the world. It is the contemplation of a man who's experienced everything that man could want. Now you see that in 10 to 11 of chapter 2. What sort of my eyes is I look at my brother. And thus he's trying to find meaning to life, purpose to life, in satisfaction by becoming a movie star, by becoming a multi-millionaire, by a, a, a getting great uh, honor in the military, by becoming a general, by being a famous writer, all those things that men hold in high esteem, become president of the United States, become a senator, become whatever it is that, that magnifies people in this life. It's interesting that this man in writing this did not resign himself to atheism or agnosticism or some sort of skepticism or just simply saying, yeah, God is, but what does that mean to me? Uh, he does. Notice he closes the book with, uh, well, I guess you'd say he holds on firmly to the notion that man must fear God. But that is his strongest duty. Fear God. And that assures man's true prosperity. Let me read you a couple of passages here. They were close to class. Chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, the end of the thing. There is nothing better for man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten wherein here unto more than I? For God give to a man that is good in his sight and wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he, he giveth travail 
to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God, that is also his vanity and vexatious spirit. Um, if we view that portion of this from the standpoint that he's giving you a flash of light, this is where you're really going to end up over here in chapter 12. Then we get some understanding. But we still, at this point, if we stop the book, we'll sort of say, well, at least the events of things came from God. I'm saying basically, well, no, that came from God, but he doesn't tell us really what should be done and just enjoy what God's given you under the sun, especially material and, and that kind of thing. And there's more to it than that. More to it than that. He really comes out and says that the great enjoyment of life comes within the limits of fearing God Jesus Christ. I guess we'll stop there. <laughs> Um, and do you have any questions? Anything you want to say regarding it? Any additions? Any?